this off just with a little bit of clarification. Now, historically speaking, and when we look into these ancient societies, when we start looking at rites of passage, specifically with initiations, these tend to lean a little bit more towards the masculine. So if I, in my discussion, tend to lean a little bit more towards the masculine, you'll forgive me. It's not because I don't feel that initiatic rites of passage are important to females, but just historically, with the research that's available, they tend to lean more towards males. That being said, there are initiatic rites that are driven specifically towards the feminine, uh, which I think are important, and we'll discuss some of those as well. Uh, hopefully, what I have to say is of some interest, right? But really, all of this is going to boil down to uh, the macro culture of the Western society, uh, another culture of the U.S. society, and then we can subcategorize a little bit of the culture of our Mormon or our LDS society. So, while I go through this, think of how some of these apply to us specifically in our culture here in. Happy Valley, uh, and the cultures that you're going to be going to and working in in the world, and uh, certainly in the, in the Western civilizations. I've written some notes down because there's some things that I want to portray specifically, uh, but I hope not to just be reading this to you the whole time, but you'll forgive me if I go through some of this. The first thing that I think comes up is that our uh, dying culture or our decay of society is somewhat prevalent prevalent if we take a close look. The technology that we have seems to not be advancing as quickly as it once was, although still quick, not, not as rapid as it was through the 80s and 90s. We pollute our cities, we poison our waters and our mountains, all in an effort to advance our societies and our cultures. Our cities are filthy, loud places where people who are in a hurry to get nowhere, to do nothing, and complain about no time that they have to do it constantly are in battle with each other. We see this also in the relationship between the sexes. No longer do we have pleasant relationships between men and women, but instead we are using each other and, and we simmer in a swarm of distrust oftentimes. Why? Why has this happened? What has brought our society to this point? So I believe that the evolution of a species very much like the evolution of a society, is not pinpointed to one specific event, but instead, several things that have brought that position to fruition. Whether that, again, is a species or our culture or our society. Now, an accumulation of these successive steps for a particular outcome, for better or for worse, whether the outcome is positive or negative, we've seen evolution bringing our society to where we are now. So. I suggest, or I guess what I'm, what I'm going to suggest today, is that our Western society has failed us in the transition from childhood to adulthood. And in that failing, many will reach their physical prime without actually ever obtaining a, physio a psychological, a mental, or a spiritual maturity. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where I'm going to be platforming from. So the question that brings into mind then that is going to be hypothetical, but if you have uh, ideas on this, it would be something that would be interesting here. The, the, the hypothetical question is, if you are a man or a woman, how do you know? Or perhaps a follow-up question to that is, when did you become a man or a woman? Now, I'm not speaking specifically biological or physical, right? Becoming male doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Right? Becoming a female, we didn't really put a whole lot of our our effort into this. That kind of happened for us. But when did you actually become a man? When did you actually become a woman? Realizing again, coming back to the idea of evolution, that this is not a singular event that we can pinpoint, say, at this point I was, but instead a succession of steps. So, then another question that I bring to the table is, what does it mean to be a man or a woman? And with that, I mean again, not just legally, not just sexually, but what does it mean to be emotionally, morally, spiritually a man, spiritually a female, a woman, sorry. And how does a young girl or a young boy in our fast-paced, highly technological world that we witness as part of all of this, how do we bring these young men and young women into a mature, spiritual, healthy adulthood? 
Now, the classification of the transition from girl or boy to man or woman uh, is founded in the physiological and anatomical changes, right? Again, we're talking male, female. That's easy. Everyone experiences that as they go through. Changes in body size, emerging sexuality, these are all pivotal points of life. Now, these are not the only definition of ourselves, right? We cannot just define an individual by their biological system. Instead, we have a cultivation of friendships. We have the development of physical strengths and mental strengths, the awakening of intellectual curiosities. We have the differentiation from family. These are all other developmental signs. So as we start to grow and mature, this is beyond just aging, right? Okay, so in fact, I believe that one of the major tasks of adolescence as we start to pass through this age is that both young men and young women start to develop a self-identity. This is when they become themselves. Now with that self-identity, those who are helped through this process, we found through, re through some research, they have an easier steps finding the necessity or the, the necessary qualifications to become a man or a woman. Then they can answer the questions such as, can I make it on my own? Where, what do I have what it takes to make it on my own? But perhaps the ultimate expression of the, existen of the existential uncertainty question is, where do I fit in? Which I think is a key point of what we try to develop in our maturity. Where do I fit in? Now, the adolescent who does not have guidance through their life tends to remain stuck in adolescence. This is where we see quite literally the man-child. Now, having asked the questions, having reached out for help and not receiving any, the only option that they have is to take the worst of their adolescent behavior, the self-absorbed, the aggressive nature, and develop that into some kind of adulthood. That's when we start to see things like Columbine. That's when we see things like addictions of every kind, not only chemical with the drugs and the alcohol, but also pornography. We also see domestic violence. These self-absorbed, egotistical, adolescent behaviors were never dismissed in an acceptance of adulthood because they had no way of knowing when they could arrive or how they could arrive. Now, with all of that then, we have human doings and very few human beings. Now, any attempt to reshape our lives throughout this without a rite of initiation or a discovery into a rite of passage brings in several concerns, several problems. Now, our society, and in general, is not very kind to initiate rites of passage. Now, what has been effective in the past may not be effective now, but I want to show some research that's been done that will suggest that rites of passage are uh, somewhat necessary for our society. But before I go too far, one of the examples I want to give of a rite of passage that I think is applicable to us today, particularly to you, is college. This was initially looked at as a rite of passage. Family sends the kid off to go to college, to grow up, to learn, to become something more. And in that, then, they have experiences that allows them to grow and mature. Some of those experiences were very good, but have developed into some experiences that are very poor. We see hazing through sororities and fraternities. We see binge drinking. We see these parties that are the adolescent's attempt of trying to initiate themselves into some kind of rite of passage to find adulthood. Now, beyond that, we need to ask ourselves, what are rites? and rituals and ceremonies. What do I mean when I say rites? And I mean R-I-T, right, the rites. A rite is defined as a formal or ceremonial act or procedure prescribed or customary in religious or other solemn use. All right, that's wordy. A ritual is a traditional and ordered sequence of collective actions in which a sacred purpose is achieved through interplay between the sacred and the mundane. Again, very wordy. Now let's combine this into the idea of a rite of passage. Now there are two sociologists, Moore and Hable, that said that a ritual action through which the initiate is separated from one world and taken to another can be considered to be a rite of passage. Okay, so we'll talk about the steps of the rites of passage here momentarily, but if we start thinking about this, and we think of a, uh, 
a ritualistic ceremony, much like the Catholic baptism. Of course, we have ours. The Catholic confirmation, matrimony, and the extreme unction, or the final rites, which I thought this was interesting that I found the final rites with one of our LDS uh, painters painting the backgrounds. <laughs> Now, in the LDS culture, when we start pulling this over to our, our culture here, we have our own rites. We have our own rituals. And although I believe that we have failed to emphasize them as rites of passage, even still, they remain within our society. Much like our Catholic brothers and sisters, we have baptism, we have confirmation, we have matrimony. Additionally, we have the passing of Sawyer, baptism, confirmation, matrimony, and additionally, as I mentioned, we have the passing of priesthood keys at the age of 12. We also have young men's, young women's services, washings and anointings. We have the mission, and I tried to find the youngest looking missionaries I could. <laughs> we also have the endowments. We have the opportunity, one after another, to impress upon the minds of our young men and young women coming into adulthood that they can pass through a rite of passage when they can then be determined that you are no longer a boy, or you are no longer a girl. You need to start acting like a man or a woman. Now, the rites of stripping away the world view that show us our connected nature, that show us how our souls are all intertwined, which in our community we like to coin as the eternal family. They are designed to help us discover who we really are. All right, so besides the initiation rituals to demonstrate stages of life, there are also initiation rituals for special occasions. These could come into coordination or ordination or, for us, academic graduations. Also, initiations into a secret society or the initiation of a shaman. Okay, so we have not only these religious, kind of set-apart, baptismal stuff, we also have other societal initiations that we can go through as well. Both of which are marked in an effort to become a rite of passage for the individual to go from youth or adolescence into adulthood and maturity. And they're all interesting because they all have some of the same uh, themes and the same ideas associated with them. Now, Sociologists, and anyone in here speak French? You can maybe help me. Anybody speak Spanish? Good, you can help me. So, I'll come to words that I don't know how to, don't know how to pronounce. Sociologists, though, let me come back to this, have identified three phases that constitute a proper rite of passage. Okay. There's separation, transition, and reincorporation. Those are our three steps. So separation, the transition, and then the reincorporation of the individual. Arnold von Gnapp. This guy is heralded as one of the great researchers with rites of passage, and he wrote a book uh, titled, and you'll have to help me with this, I think it's Le Rast de Passage. That's as good as I can get. Is that pretty close? Uh, fair enough. We'll go for it. Now, he was born in Germany. He was fr he then lived in France. France. He was born to a Dutch father, so he had a fairly eclectic background. But Van Gennat argues that the rites of passage comprise of the liminal, I'm sorry, the preliminal, the liminal, and the postliminal, literally meaning the before, at, and past the threshold. And what he's argued, what he suggested, was that it was the threshold of maturity. Okay. Now, let's talk briefly about each one of these phases. The separation phase. This is symbolically used and physically used. Now, what I mean is, in many cultures, again, even in our own cultures, we have remnants of this, but in many cultures, the individual is literally removed from the family or the, or the, uh, the tribe, the area. They're literally moved away, physically removed, okay? Separated from the former life. That former life is then killed. Right? There's a death involved in this. That death then puts them into a period of kind of this limbo, not sure where, and then there's going to be a rebirth. But right now we're in this separation, this death idea. All right. This often involves rites of uh, removing clothing or removing body parts, like hair, being shaved, uh, 
physical mutilation oftentimes has happened in the past and even currently in some ancient cultures, which we'll come to some examples. One of the, the Mandarin tribe that uh, is, is popular with their rites of passage, the young man is literally removed from the tribe and put into a hut for three days, and no one can go in or out of the hut. So they're literally placed away in kind of a dark cave. In other tribes, boys' heads are shaved, I mentioned they're ritually uh, bathed or tattooed. And a more modern example in the military, you are sent away to boot camp. Your belongings from your former life are taken and stored away while you're given a uniform and your head is shaved in preparation for something to come. Uh, something to come then is the transition. That transition is when the initiate is between worlds. They are, no, they are not yet initiated into the maturity or into the secret society or into wherever they're going, but they're no longer part of that world that they were part of. It is now dead, so now they're again kind of in this limbo stage. Now with that, they are taught, uh, hopefully, new knowledge that they will soon become full-fledged. You will soon receive something that will be of importance to you that will grow you in levels. Okay. Taught, uh, let's see, often he's called upon to pass tests that he's ready to take this leap. In tribal societies, elders would impart the initiate uh, with what it was meant to be a man. So this is where they'd take you aside and say, okay, being a man means this, and here's how you have to act. act. The matrons would take the young women and say, to be a woman is more than just being able to carry a child. There's more to it, and here's what it is, right? So the lessons then are imparted. This is when the initiate would uh, participate in some ritual ceremony, often involved in pain and endurance. Now in the case of the new soldier, he's yelled at, he's prodded, exercised, disciplined, hopefully to receive rank and title. That brings us then to that final stage. The final step, uh, incorporation. This is where the initiate then is reincorporated into the old world, hopefully as a new individual. Now, having passed through each test that, he, that was necessary for this transition, he has proved himself or, her, or herself, hopefully, worthy to receive the final information, the final stage. Here he's then recognized, or she is recognized, as a man or a woman, and expected to act as such. This also gives them rights to participate in other ceremonies as a man or a woman. For example, marriage. You in tribes cannot be married until you've proven that you're a man or a woman. A man can't take a girl to wife. He can only take a woman. So that woman would have had to have gone through, through her rites of passage and been initiated into her womanhood. Ad additionally, same thing for a man. He couldn't be married, or he could, a boy could not be married to a woman. Now, for the soldier, if I'm using this example to carry on, um, boot camp is done. He and his family and friends would come, up, come together for a ceremony to recognize their full-fledged membership into the military. Uh, they get their flag ceremony and they get a march in front of everybody and get their salute. And their initiation is done. Now, during all of these phases and processes, the men who have gone through the ritual themselves, or the women who have gone through these ritual themselves, then can turn and guide a young initiate through this. The understanding is that they now have some knowledge or some experience that the others do not. Now by controlling these rites of passage, the men and the women in that society, in that tribe, in that culture, they then hold control of who can become a man or a woman. Now, as already stated, in the traditional mentoring process, mentors themselves have been mentored. One must have this ex uh, personal experience <coughs> of the rite of passage in, or in order to offer that to the next generation. So let's uh, give some examples of rites of passage and ceremonies. The young Native American set off into the, oh, oh, look at that, I added a slide I didn't even remember. This is the separation, transition, reincorporation idea. Uh, Von Gnapp calls them the liminal. Preliminal, liminal, and postliminal. Now, let's get to this, sorry. The young Native American sent off into the darkness with nothing but a bow and arrow. He's expected to come back with a pelt or two or three. Now, this shows not only that he has become a man, but that he is now a valuable asset to the tribe because he can help us gather food. The, Ma the Masai warrior 
tasked with stalking and killing a lion with just himself and his spirit. Again, proves not only that he's become a man, but that he has the bravery to face almost insurmountable odds. The donning of a glove lined with the stinging bullet ants. The ritual tattooing or marking. All of these are examples of what I would call ancient rites of passage, although they're still being used today. One that's a little bit more uh, modern is the bar mitzvah, or the bat mitzvah, when the young Jewish boy or girl come of age, and that's when they're expected to continue and act like a, like a man or a woman. Okay, let me run through some additional ones that might be interesting, some that you may have already heard of. This is the Hindu dedication of self, the Dikska. Burmese boys, they spend, the Buddhist boys spend three days long in a ceremony to go from boy to man. The Jewish coming of age that I mentioned, the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah. This is the bullet ant ceremony when they put the bullet ant, I don't know if you're familiar with this, its bite feels like they say a bullet shot. So they put bullet ants inside the gloves and they make them dance around with it for 10 minutes. The Bapi tribe of South Africa, this is the ritualistic tattooing and marking of the skin. The Masi coming of age tradition, the cow jumping. The Amish coming of age, this is the Rumspringa, when they get to leave home and go out and experience the world and all of the devil inside of it. The Hispanic coming of age, who speaks Spanish, what is this called? Pinciera. That's it, the Pinciera. I'm sure I said it wrong just then too. How about the American Sweet 16 coming of age? The Japanese coming of age, anybody here speak Japanese? Sijin no Hi, I think, I don't know, probably pronounced that wrong. Poisong Long. Spartans, they used the agogi or the kriptia. The walkabout, when the family sends the kid off, go do. Go do what you're going to do. Come back if you can. Acceptance into a fraternal organization or a secret society. Again, for us, graduation. Trade unions. Naval. Military. Right? The military has their own stuff, and the Navy you might get thrown off the set of boats so you can swim back up. One that is unfortunate that we find an increase in its numbers is gang initiations. Young boys and young women, again, wanting to prove themselves man or woman, being initiated into some kind of rite of passage, find that answer within a gang. Perhaps some of the oldest ceremonies, the oldest rites of passage, were found in Egypt. The mystery schools here uh, then gave birth to quite a few. And a lot of initiatic rites, particularly in Europe and in Western civilization, went to trace their lines back to something with the Egyptian rites. There were quite a few then. Most famous of the ancient rites that has ties into Egyptian rites, but the Egyptian rites seem to be separate. There was a Greek rite called the Aleutian rites. The Aleutian rites are interesting <coughs> because they also are seen uh, well, sorry, they, they celebrate Ceres. Anyone know who Ceres is? Um, All right, Ceres' daughter was uh, uh, Persephone. Demeter was another, uh, another name, or Rhea, or Isis. So we see Isis being celebrated in Egypt. We see uh, Ceres being celebrated in Greece. So this is all in celebration of, of their daughter, of her daughter, right? And the story goes where she was taken away by the underworld god, Hades, and that's when winter came. When she comes back is when spring comes back, right? But there was this initiatic rite that we still don't have all the answers to, the Aleutian rites. What was going on here? We don't have all the answers. But it is one of the ancient ones that we look back to and see that it was there. Plato was initiated in this as an example. The Aleutian rites are interesting because, and I think that they'll be interesting for us today, uh, and while I'm doing this, will someone pull out a scripture for me? Will you read a scripture for me? Sure. Look up Helaman chapter 14, verse 16. Give that one mic. The Aleutian philosophers, they believed that birth into the physical world, our birth, was actually our death. This was the fullest sense of death. And when you have that scripture, go ahead and read it. 1416. 1416. Yea, behold, this death bringeth to pass the resurrection and redeemeth all mankind from the first death, that spiritual death. For all mankind by the fall of Adam being cut off from the presence of the Lord, 
are considered as dead, both as to things temporal and thing, and to things spiritual. So here we are, reading our own scriptures, believing that we have had a very literal death in our physical birth. We died to come here and do this. Right? We've had this separation, the spiritual death. So the illusions believe the same thing. Being born into this world was quite literally a death. And that this that we're experiencing is not what we really are. Now the only true birth, they believe, was that of the spiritual soul rising up out of this world, out of its fleshly, fleshy nature. The soul is dead that slumbers, says Longfellow. This strikes the keynote at the Aleutian Mysteries. They believe that the soul, our spiritual nature, that is not awakened, is literally dead and sleeping. So it's our job then to find a way to awaken this. That's, uh, that's the mission. An ancient initiate once said that the living are ruled by the dead. Only those conversant with the Aleutian concept of life would understand that statement. And I believe in association with human scripture, I think that we can kind of understand that. Right? Let me rephrase, or let me restate that. The living are ruled by the dead. So it means that the majority of the people are not ruled by their spiritual selves, but rather their senseless, or hence dead, animalistic personalities. Now let me... Uh, uh, let me hasten a little bit here and talk about some reasons and functions of initiation. In, my, in the readings and the research that we have, we have three reasons for initiation. First is a ritual death, which we talked about. We have to cut this world off. Uh, that gives us then conquest over real death. We no longer fear death. And, initi and number two, initi initiation's function is to reveal the meaning of existence, spiritual birth. Number three, it reveals a new world of transhuman, a world that, in philosophical terminology, is transcendental. We are all together in this together. Right? We're all connected somehow. We like to call this our spiritual family, and our mission is to seal that family together. So, there are several types. We have psychological, religious, tribal, which we've already spoken about some of these. The psychological one is interesting. I mentioned earlier hazing in college. And actually, research shows strong evidence that that's a positive thing. Because the mind then has to go through some kind of justification of why was I just hazed, and the people who were hazing over justification of why we're doing this to an innocent in individual. That then cultivates relationship and tightens those bonds. Interestingly enough, whether or not we agree, there's some evidence that shows that hazing is, uh, has, has a reward. Religious or spiritual, again, we talked about. Uh, the con in the context of ritual magic and esotericism, the initiation is considered to cause a fundamental change. You are supposed to change from your base self into something different. And again, if we go back to one of my original statements, is I don't believe that the evolution of man is in one step. Just like I don't believe that our evolution of spiritual self is going to be in one step. We, of course, we talked about our tribal initiations, where boys are literally taken out of the tribe and created to be men or women. Girls, they say it took one to two months. Boys, three to four. Good job, ladies. You made it quicker than we did. Now, of course, becoming a man or a woman is a process. As I mentioned, this is not overnight. But this gives us the opportunity to be able to answer the question, have I manned up? Have I made it? Am I a man? Or am I a woman? Now, why are these important? Let's cut to this. Let's cut to the meat a little bit. Paul Shepard, he's a, de a developmental psychologist, said, "Quote: The only society more frightful than one ran by children, as in Golding's Lord of the Flies, might be one ran by childish adults." Dr. Campbell, another sociologist and researcher, proposes that the lack of myths in our society and the current state of our social dismay, dismay, sorry. Uh, including our youth engaged in a variety of high-risk behaviors, the lack of those myths are going to pop up somewhere else. What I mean is, quote, it is not too much to say that ritual is more to society than words are to thought. It is impossible to have social relations without symbolic acts. If ritual is suppressed in one form, it crops up in another. 
If we suppress the idea that we have a rite of passage to bring a young boy to be a man, or a young woman to become, or a young girl to become a woman, somewhere that rite of passage will pop up. And if we don't have elders in our community helping foster a healthy way for that to happen, the youth will find a way to do it for themselves, which we see. And in that, we see the detriment to our society. Okay. According to international expert Dr. Rubenstein, the shift from boy to man is not one that occurs naturally. Again, you'll have to forgive me for leaning a little bit more on the masculine side, but I think this applies to women as well. The difference is two, the difference in the two, from boy to man, is so fundamental that even a significant shift won't happen without assistance. So that significant shift from boy into man, Dr. Rubenstein suggests needs someone to assist. Okay. Uh, and I, I, here's one of my statements that I think is relatively bold but accurate. Neither man nor woman can lead a healthy and fulfilling life if he or she is still functioning at the level of a boy or a girl so, uh, and their community around them will suffer. They will not have the ability to provide a positive contribution around them. This is why it's so important for us to be able to find these rites of passage and to foster them as a rite of passage. This must come from an outside source claiming authority in that. Again, if you'll remember when I said elders in that community are the ones who have already gone through and then allow others to go through, they can control that who is going to be a man and who is going to be a woman. That needs to come from some kind of authority that can either stand on that or show that they have the authority to make a boy a man or to make a girl a woman. So, there's a strong belief that the risk-taking behavior displayed by teenage boys is in fact their attempts at self-initiation. The fast cars, binge drinking, fighting in the street, drugs, these are only a few examples of them trying to prove their manliness. Unfortunately, these come with heavy consequences. So, we as our social creature that we are, form groups, band together, stay in families, stay in societies. We feel these bonds. We cohabitate, cooperate, cohere with each other. Somewhere in this, there's a rite of passage, whether it's recognized, whether it's named, whether it is official or not, ritualistic in nature. We have a rite of passage that will bring these people through this process, we hope. The, tri the tribes that were most successful, the tribes that became the strongest, were the ones that had the most successful initiation. Now, the rites of passage, these will exist in an effort to consolidate these social ties, our family ties, whether that's a blood family or a tribal family or a religious family. Now, all of these, of course, boil down to simple tests of, of a person's courage. What, a lot of the ones that I've, we've been talking about. They, will test your fortitude, your aptitude, whether or not you're going to contribute to the tribe. Going out with a spear to kill a lion not only proves that you're brave and strong, but you'll be able to gather food for the tribe and your family as well. Ideally, it means that you've garnished skills necessary to be able to go into a chosen field and work. Right? If you can go out and kill a lion, you're going to be able to hunt for the tribe. We can say the same thing in a collegiate level of education. Hopefully you've come to this point where when you graduate you'll be able to go out into your chosen field and actually be successful. This is your rite of passage and when you are done you'll be able to say I did that by an individual who claims and can prove authority and has given me a piece of paper that now claims that I am an authority and I'll be able to do that for others. So looking through this hopefully it's not just a badge of honor right but instead it is literally something that proves that you, you're able and have gone through. Today we have ID cards, social, social security numbers, badges, political party affiliations, and Facebook friend lists. Resumes with official titles, these remind us who we are, where we are in the world, what we do and what we know. But are these enough? Right? Do we need the formality? Do we need physical and mental orders to bring us through a spiritual uh, communion with God. A man or a woman is someone who understands why they're here on earth. 
why they were born. Their offering is a unique contribution than more than just their presence in this human world. Becoming a man or a woman means you become authentic. You become yourself. You become you. You're no longer a reflection of your parents. The soul of man, often called the psyche, by Lipa, and the Aleutian mysteries, symbolized by Persephone, is essentially a spiritual thing, which I mentioned. The ancient philosophers, to them, birth into the physical world is a death in the fullest sense of the word. And the only true birth was that of the spirit or soul of man rising out of the tomb of his fleshy nature. The soul is dead that slumbers is a, is a statement that strikes at the heart of the key of the initiatic experience. Okay. Finally. Oh, there's Persephone. Sorry, guys, I did uh, slides I didn't even know I did. Perception. Perception. What is it? Perception. That's it. Dante's Inferno. Anybody ever read Dante? So his Inferno. <laughs> so his, he has three books, right, that we often combine into one. But Inferno, this is his travel through hell. And in this, symbolically, he describes the sufferings of those who are never free from their spiritual natures, their cravings, their habits, their viewpoints. Those who made no endeavor to improve themselves. They're the souls who slept, the souls who were dead, and are damned to repeat this forever. They are living then in their physical lives, passed in to Hades. Laying in rows, they slept through eternity, as they, as they slept through their physical life. I need one more scripture. We read a scripture for me. We look up Alma 34, 34. While you look that up. An ancient initiate once said that the living are ruled by the dead. Those who are conversant with the initiate rites of passage understand that statement. The majority of people are not ruled by their own living self. This has nothing to do with who my president is or who my prophet is or who anybody else is. But for me, if I am not ruled by my living self, I am ruled by my dead self. Go ahead and read Alma 34. 34, 34? Yes, please. You cannot say when you are brought to that awful crisis that I will repent, that I will return to my God. Nay, you cannot say this. That same spirit which doth possess your bodies at the time that you go out of this life, that same spirit will have power to possess your body in that eternal world. If we do not awaken our souls now, we may not have another opportunity to do so. Therefore, when we look at the youth, in our world, not only in our LDS culture, but if we look at the youth, is there a way that we can awaken them spiritually, which is the most important? It's great for us to learn earthly knowledge, but for us to learn heavenly knowledge is golden. So, there's a bunch of the people left sided. Let me ask a couple of questions. Are there ways then, in an educational background, seeing that the majority of you are heading in that direction. Are there ways to be able to inject ritual or rite into the educational setting? Even before we ask that question, is that a responsibility of educators to give a rite of passage to help initiate our youth into adulthood? The answer is no, then we can just wrap up and go. <laughs> Please. I think there are, there are a lot of Rights, and I, there are a lot of rights of taxes al already in place. Um, I think some are you know, people view them as more effective or less effective depending on what, but like you know, just graduating um, or just being accepted into a, a school or something like that. Um, and then there's always like little milestones along the way. Even just completing a class could be one and totally. getting it. And, Great. So let me ask you then, with your comment, would it be your responsibility, assuming that you'll be an educator? Uh, more or less, yeah. Okay. Would it therefore then be your responsibility to say, hey, you were accepted into this, or hey, you passed my class, or we're coming up onto your graduation? This should mark something in your life, or is it just the individual's responsibility to sort that out? Meaning, should you be a mentor in that position and reach your hands out? I think that's a good question because one of my critiques of rites of passage is, is if they are meaningless, like, oh, great, you passed this class, but 
what does that mean when, for you moving on? Um, so I would think, for if I had a stewardship over that person, then I would say, I do have a responsibility to, to make sure it's a meaningful rite of passage that will help them, instead of me just, you know, in my made-up authority saying, yes, the, you, you got a name in my class. That's great. Now you're awesome. Like, right. But to have a really meaningful thing that will lead to something else. Agreed. Any other thoughts on this? Let me ask another question. So there's two research, Arm and Roxka. These research suggest, their research suggested that academic life, meaning the learning of what we do, actually comes secondary or tertiary to the importance of students. First thing was social life. We see a reflection of this with uh, the student centers and all of the activities that we do and all of the fun stuff that we get to go do with students and all the posters that we put up for all of the events that are going to happen. But the actual work in class and hitting the books and writing the papers is no longer the primary importance. One of the stereotypical example, uh, and I grew up in Provo, so I think I can use this, is coming to BYU to find the eternal companion. I'm not coming to go to school, I'm coming to get married. Is this acceptable? my question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so if uh, just sort of uh, following on with what you were talking about with Matt, if every educator tries to turn their class into a rite of passage, then doesn't that make it meaningless or at least less meaningful? If, you know, Great question. You're overloaded with rites of passage. Absolutely. Uh, and I think a, a question in return is do we have any? Are any teachers doing that? Or do we see that at all? And so if one teacher does it, is that a singular lesson, or are there others doing it? In my education up to this point, I have yet to have either an entire college or an individual teacher tell me, this is now a step in your life, start acting appropriate. So then my question is, you're absolutely right. If every teacher does this, it will lose significance. But my retort to that is that no one is doing this for fear that someone else is doing this. So where does the responsibility lie? Well, don't, I mean, so sorry to follow up, but uh, don't, isn't high school, I mean, so all of these classes sort of lead up to a rite of passage with the graduation from high school, or lead up to your entrance into college, or lead into you know, the completion of a degree or a graduate degree, which lead into your first job, which are all, I would say, rites of passage, and everything else is a stepping stone into that rite of passage. So if I mean, it seems like the rite of passage is graduation from high school, entrance into college, graduation, and so forth. And then, of course, we have our spiritual rites of passage through baptism and through covenants and other things. But if every class that we teach is another rite of passage, what? Or even if even if you take up three of those classes and say, well, these are rites of passage too, aren't those all just supposed to be building up to a larger rite of passage anyway? No, and I appreciate that. Uh, again, though, I don't think that anyone is emphasizing rites of passage high school or college. I don't think anyone is saying this is the step for you that you now have become or here we go, right? You're becoming. And perhaps a better, uh, a better argument would be instead of saying uh, this class is a rite of passage for you, would to be this program. When we finish this, this should be the tantamount. This should be the apex of your passage. You should now be considering yourself as such. Or, you guys should have passed through this already. Grow up. Stop complaining about your homework. Put on your big boy pants and come to school. But instead, we've coddled each other too much to say, it's okay, you'll grow up eventually. And we see 40-year-old boys not wanting to move away from home, making $20,000 a year. I agree with you. If we do this too much, it'll lose its potency. But right now, I don't think that we're doing it at all. Or very little. Please. Um, so I, I see your point in 
that uh, the ritual kind of creeps up um, no matter what, whether you provide it or not, right? Uh, so like you said, college, the lifestyle of college students in the United States is infamous um, for alcohol and drugs and sex life and all sorts of things. Um, I'd be interested to see though, how do you kind of tell or measure um, when the rituals that you try and put in place are effective. For instance, here at BYU, they have freshman orientation. Um, I mean, can you talk to those students afterwards and say, so do you feel like a college student now? Sure. Or is it not till after like freshman year that they actually feel like, I am a college student, you right. know, and I am an adult away from home? Uh, I'm running short on time. Let me give you my two thoughts. Um, and then there are a couple of questions. My two thoughts on that are, again, I don't think that this is a singular event. Coming into adulthood is, a, is an evolution of self, right? So it's a, an accumulation of several events that's going to ultimately, hopefully, get us there. And the only person that really can determine whether or not you have obtained that is going to be yourself. But for those steps to be initiated, for those steps to be started, there has to be an individual that says, I have the authority to start this. Let's get it going. An apostolistic kind of event, right, where I say, I have the keys. I'm now passing them on, as it were. What I think, where I think we're failing is saying, you have now been given, right? Hey, my, my 12 year old son, you've now been given the priesthood keys. Grow up, boy. Like it's time you start acting like a man. You now hold great power. <clears throat> so let's let's start acting like a man. Let's stop. Let's put away boy things. Doesn't mean we don't have to stop building the treehouse. But let's stop acting like a boy and let's start acting like a man, or at least start thinking about it. And I don't think that that is actually determined that I'm a man until later down the road. If you'll join me in thanking Matt. Oh, thank you.